Well, good morning. My name is Gordon Palmer, I'm Minister at Claremont Parish Church, and this is our service for Sunday, the 18th of April. As well as myself taking part in the service, Valerie Stewart um, is doing a Bible reading, and John McCart leading us in our prayers for others. In the book of Romans, um, <clears throat> chapter 8, the Apostle Paul says, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. A prayer for the presence of the Spirit, the reality of our Spirit, the Spirit in our lives is in our first hymn, O Breath of Life, comes sweeping through us. Let us pray, and again we will gather up our prayers in the Lord's Prayer, the words that we use for the Lord's Prayer, the form of that will, words are on the screen. Let us pray. Lord God, you are a God who is faithful, a God who keeps your word, a God who remembers your promises and who fulfills your promises. Lord, in times past, you promised a Messiah, a servant of the Lord, who would come and be a Savior, be a Redeemer. And after years of those promises, Jesus came and fulfilled all these words that were spoken about him. And through his life, death, and resurrection, and indeed his ascension into your presence, he has fulfilled the calling to be a Savior. And also, Lord, there was the promises made and made again by Jesus of the gift of your Holy Spirit to be given to us. And again, here are promises that you've kept, words that you have fulfilled. Just as Jesus had promised, the Spirit came upon his first disciples and, and transformed their lives their experience of you, Lord, was revolutionized. Their expectations turned upside down. Their attitudes changed forever. They went from fear to conf confidence, from uncertainty to hope, from doubts to faith. They went from hiding behind locked doors to preaching openly, bravely, boldly before crowds. And the promises of the presence of your Spirit were not only for your first apostles, not only for then, but also for now, for us. And again, you are a God of your word. You are a God who keeps your promises. 
So come again, gracious God, breathing new fire into our hearts, new energy into our lives, new life into our souls. Open our minds to your calling and your purposes. Gracious God, not everyone responded to that gift of the Spirit on your church. Not everyone responded so eagerly at your coming. They'd been a bit like that with Jesus himself, and were like that too with the presence of the Spirit, choosing rather than acceptance to ridicule or choosing disbelief. And forgive us that we too can be guilty of similar responses. Forgive us too that sometimes we, instead of welcoming the Spirit, greet Him with suspicion or caution. Forgive us that instead of opening our lives to the Spirit's movement, we close our minds to anything which challenges our habits and our familiarities. Forgive us that instead of gladly receiving your Spirit's gifts and growing as you call us to, we barricade our souls against change. Forgive us when we've been like that. For when we've tried to keep you at a distance, for when we have tried to settle for just a formal nod in your general direction rather than be embraced in the warmth of your love. And open our lives to your Spirit's life-giving breath that we might live more truly as your people, following our Lord Jesus, in whose words we gather up our prayers. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. John chapter 14, verses 15 to 27. Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you, help you and be with you forever. The Spirit of Truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my father and you are in me and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Then Judas, not Judas Iscariot, said, But Lord, why do you intend to show yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Anyone who does not love me will not obey my teachings. These words you hear are not my own. They belong to the Father who sent me. All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Amen. Quite often people have said to me over the years, well, I believe in God as, as if that were all that needed to be said. Well, very good, says Jesus' brother in the book of James that he wrote. Chapter 2, he says, you believe there is one God, good. 
Even the demons believe that and shudder. Not just demons, but the people who crucified Jesus, they believed in God. That doesn't mean they were Christians. Those persecuting Jesus' believers today in many parts of the world are people who also believe in God. There is more to Christian faith than simply being able to say, oh, I believe in God. A survey a number of years ago asked some nine-year-olds about God, about the God they believed in, and amongst the replies were these, God is very kind and good and handsome too. God has given me and some people what we want. He is good. I think he has a white coat and black hair. Or again, God is the father of Jesus. I like God because he puts ideas into my head when I am in trouble with my sons. Jesus is kind because he helps people who are sick. Again, I think God is a very nice man and is very kind to everyone. Even when you or I do something wrong, God will forgive us. He punishes people when they do something very bad. He invented schools. Well, we might be amused by parts, impressed by other parts of the answers, but I, I wonder how well many folks today would be able to answer the question, okay, you say you believe in God, but who is he and what's he like? Rather than a faith that we make up, Christianity claims to be what God has shown us, what God has revealed. A foundational claim of the gospel is that God has made himself known particularly through Jesus. And rather than people coming up with their own ideas, Christian faith is about God reaching out to us, reaching out for us. Suppose someone was stranded on a, a desert island for a couple of weeks. Suppose they were there, no phone, no means of communication, nothing. Such a person wouldn't know what's going on in the outside world. Are people looking for me, he might think? Have people assumed that I've died? Have they organized my funeral? Has the wife cashed in the insurance policy? What's happening in uh, with terrorism? What's happening with this or that? Did Partick Thistle win last weekend? Are there more riots, more countries in lockdown? You see, he's cut off from all of these things and more. And there's no way of finding out. And if he's ever to find out any of these things, it would only be when he gets rescued and people tell him. Similarly, we, we do not have any direct access to God. We do not have any direct access to what he's like unless he chooses to come to us, unless he chooses to reveal himself. And so humanity discovers God not by digging down deep into our souls or by deciding what would be a good idea or making up a set of rules that we like. Rather, it is the God who is there, the God who is beyond us, the God who is outside our wee desert island who comes to us to let us know that he is there and to let us know who he is and what he's like. He reaches into our world. And he did that particularly and especially through Jesus. More than that, the gospel's claim is not just that God has passed on some information about what he's like so that we can believe in him, but he wants to know us to be in a relationship with us. The gospel is not telling us some ideas about how to live. It is God coming to us to, to, to love us and for us to love him. It's about relationships, a living relationship between a living God and people living in this world. One of the lessons that we supposedly have learnt, and I very much hope we have learnt it during this pandemic, is about the importance of relationships, about how much we have missed not being able to see others in, in ways that we d could before, about how invaluable relationships are it's the way we are. It's the way we've been wired for love, for community, for relationship. And the reason that the gospel is good news is that God coming to us is coming to us to be in a loving relationship with us. That's part of Jesus' message, for example, in verse 18 of our, of our reading. 
Jesus makes known, makes God known to us by being one with us while at the same time being one with God. But hey, that was 2,000 years ago, wasn't it? So how does that work in terms of having a relationship now? I mean, I can't just have a relationship with someone who lived a long time ago. I can find out things about Gandhi, about Elvis Presley, about Churchill, about Mar Marilyn Monroe, and, and goodness knows how many other people, but that doesn't mean I have a relationship with any of them. I can't have a relationship with any of them. They're all dead. And the living relationships I have are with people who are involved with me in life, with whom there is some personal interaction, virtual or otherwise. So, given that Jesus was on this earth 2,000 years ago, how is it that I can not just know about him, but know him and through him know God? Well, that's what Jesus was teaching his disciples in that passage in John chapter 14 that Valerie read. He was only going to be with his followers in the flesh for a, a short time beyond that. But one was coming to replace him who was going to remain with his followers for always, verse 16. And Jesus goes on to say, verse 17, that he's speaking about the Holy Spirit. He's going to send another comforter, another parakletos is the word. He's going to send this parakletos to be, to be with us, and that parakletos is the Spirit. And up until this point in, in the story in the Gospels, Jesus had been with his disciples. He was their friend, supporter, advocate, helper, comforter. And all of these words are contained in the meaning of this term parakletos that's used to describe the Spirit. And so just as Jesus was friend, supporter, advocate, helper, comforter to his disciples, so the Spirit will be all that to us and more. And so, just as Jesus' ministry on earth was about to end and to climax in his death and resurrection and ascension, and just as then through that he'd be no longer with his followers in the world, he was coming to, him in another, coming to the followers in another way. The Spirit was going to come and be just as much God to them and God with them as Jesus had been when he was with them in the flesh. And notice in the, the passage that we read how Jesus moved from the third person to the first person as he talked about the Spirit. Verse 17, the Spirit will be in you. Then verse 18, I will not leave you. I will come to you. Those who love and obey Jesus receive the Spirit, verses 16 and 17. And it is to those who love and obey him that Jesus shows himself, verse 21. You see, to, to have the Spirit was to have Jesus. To have Jesus was to have the Spirit. So in one sense, he was not going away at all. For one was going to be with his people who was so closely identified with Jesus that, that Jesus could talk about the Spirit and himself in interchangeable terms. The Spirit will be in you. I will not leave you. And so on. And sometimes we might be tempted to think that wouldn't it be so much easier to believe if we had lived when Jesus lived? If we'd seen him in action, surely that would have been much better and made faith easier. We could have seen for ourselves. But I think that's wrong on at least two counts. Firstly, there were many people who did see Jesus in action and who didn't believe. There were a lot of people who did see and hear him and walked away or crucified him. Secondly, Jesus has promised to be around with his people forever. He promised that all the benefits that his first disciples had through being with him could be ours as well through the Spirit. And not just for a few days or a few years, but for always. And not just for sometimes in the day, but throughout the day, all day. And not just in certain places, but throughout all the earth. The disciples had times when they and Jesus were separated. He was up on the Mount of Transfiguration, and they were struggling with the, 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 the challenge to heal a boy who was having fits. If Jesus was in Galilee, he couldn't be in Jerusalem. If he was on a boat in the lake, he couldn't be in the temple. 
But now, because His presence is through the Holy Spirit, He is available at all times in all places. And as a result of this promised Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Himself, Christians today, remarkable as it seems, are in a better situation than Jesus' followers. So we have to do much better than simply say, I believe in God. The gospel brings us into His presence, allows us to know God, see God, verse 20. Jesus says, I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. How close is that? How intimate is that? And so the difference between only being able to say, I believe in God, and saying, I know God, is huge. It's a bit like the difference between reading a cookery book and having a great meal. Well, you can read the cookery book. You, you can let the idea of food and of eating excite and inspire you. You could maybe look at some of the, 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 the pictures of the finished products and think how wonderful that would be. And, but if you're hungry, what you really want is not to read about food, but to have something to eat. I believe in God is a bit like, I've got this cookery book. I know God. I, I have received the Spirit is a bit more like eating, being fed, being nurtured. So do you just believe in God, or is He with you, in you, known by you? For that is the reality that Jesus promised His followers and the reality that he brought when the Holy Spirit was given to the church after Jesus ascended. As we were saying last week, the ascension makes clear that Jesus' mission was to be taken on and, and furthered by his followers. His people were now the body of Christ in the world, but they weren't left just to their own selves, just to their own devices and their own resources, their own ideas and their own wisdom. He gave his Holy Spirit to be with them. And so, as just as Peter and Matthew and Andrew and Mary and Martha could be helped by Jesus being with them, so too would all the church all over the world, over all of time, be helped by the Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus with us. That's why it's such a shame, such a tragedy when we live in such a way, and when we give the impression that Christianity is only a vague believing in God, or Christianity is only about what we do and what we think, when we focus on rules, or the church as an organization or institution, when we are more concerned about our own programs and events and so on. Jesus didn't offer to provide us with any or indeed all of that. He promised His Spirit. So what do you think Jesus reckoned that we most needed? We're going to continue in our service by the hymn, Holy Spirit, Living Breath of God. After the hymn, we'll confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed, and then John McCart will be leading us in our prayers for others. And then before our closing hymn, I want to come back with just one other thought about the, the Spirit. But firstly, the hymn, Holy Spirit, Living Breath of God. Thank you. 
I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Good morning. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as with our earthly parents, when we did not get our own way, we got angry. At times we get angry with you. Why is God letting this or that happen? Why me? God, you haven't answered our prayer. Although you have answered but not in the way we want. Help us to have faith and understand more the words, not my way, but yours, Lord. We would ask your blessing on people of all faiths and those who have none at this time of trial and uncertainty. Give them strength and comfort. Give them hope and patience to endure the hardships of being unable to have visits from friends or family. Give strength to those who fear to leave their homes at this time. Father, bless and protect all who care for the sick and distressed at this time, whether in hospital or in their home. Give them the physical and mental strength to carry out this stressful work day after day. We ask you to give protection and hope to our brothers and sisters in Christ, who throughout the world are being persecuted for their faith, being killed and made homeless because they love you. We pray that if we, in their position, we would have their strength. Thank you, Father, for the ministry team here at Claremont and throughout the world, who by word and example make your word known to us. We thank you for the leaders and teachers of the young people of our congregation who work to introduce them to the love of you and your Son, Jesus Christ. As we approach another national parliamentary election, we ask you to give wisdom and foresight to those we elect to govern on our behalf. Let it do be the front forefront of their minds that justice and equality for all comes before party dogma. Lord, give strength, hope and blessing to all who mourn the loss of a loved one, who are homeless or are out of work and worry about how they can keep their home and family together, although it may be the last thing they are thinking of, let them know you love them and care for them. These things we would ask in the name and for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, in in Luke chapter 11, just after Jesus had taught his followers the prayer that we call the Lord's Prayer, Jesus followed that on about that relationship with God, that interaction with God, and about receiving the Spirit. And he, he said in verse 13 of Luke 11, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Luke chapter 11, verse 13. 
If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So how do you get the Holy Spirit? What do you have to do? Ask. It's about believing Jesus, trusting Jesus, taking him at his word, and asking. It's the step that says, go beyond the recipes of the cookery book and actually start making the stuff, doing it. And as we do it, we seek God's help. We ask God to give us the Spirit. And trying to live the Christian life without the Holy Spirit, it's a bit like Lewis Hamilton trying to win the driver's championship again by pushing his car around the various Grand Prix tracks. Get in the car, Lewis, switch the engine on, use the power you've been given and provided with, because you're not going to win by just pushing the car. There's an engine there that's powerful, use it. So it's not just your intelligence, your goodness, your whatever. We've been given the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit that we might live with the Spirit, live in the Spirit, and have the Spirit shape and change and transform us. Now, of course, there is much more that could and should and indeed has been said about the Holy Spirit. For now, simply, the point is that that is what Jesus intended. It was his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and he said when he had ascended to be with the Father, he would send the gift of the Spirit to be on his people for always. He didn't just leave his followers to see what they could do, what they could make of things. He said that he was going to be with them, this time not in the body, but through the Spirit. He said he would come to us, help us, guide us, comfort us, challenge us through the Spirit. What do you think Jesus reckoned that we most needed? Not a few thousand pounds, not some impressive buildings, not some fantastic liturgy. It's a real wow. But the life of God in the here and now, the kind of forgiving, inspiring, life-transforming life that he was living himself with the disciples as he went around Galilee. And here the good news is, through the Holy Spirit, and you only have to ask to receive the Spirit, Luke eleven thirteen. Through the Spirit, that's exactly the kind of life, the kind of adventure that Jesus invites us to. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, we thank you that you are a God not just to be believed in, but to be tasted and experienced and known So, Lord, help us to be open to your presence. Help us to be open to following you, to hearing you speak to us, to following your lead. Help us to be open when you point out things that we need to change, something to give up, something to take up, or whatever. And forgive us for the dreadful sin of the times we've imagined that we can live the Christian life by ourselves, that we can follow Jesus in our own strength, that we can follow Jesus on our terms. Forgive us, and Lord, grant us fresh and, and fuller tasting of your Spirit, that the glory of our lives might be yours. Amen. As I was saying, the presence of Jesus in a physical body meant that he couldn't be in different places at the same time, but through the Spirit he can, and in a moment we'll conclude our service with a hymn, All Over the World, The Spirit is Moving. Just before I do, um, to say to folks that we plan to have services back here in 
um, the building at Claremont, and starting from a couple of weeks' time, starting on Sunday, uh, May the 2nd, the service is going to be at a different time. It's going to be at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's not something that we can't repeat our, our morning service um, because of the restrictions still of the pandemic. We're only going to be able to have about 20-plus folk here. We still have to wear face masks. There will be no singing. There will be certainly no meeting up with one another and, and having a chat across around the room and so on. Um, these restrictions are still... Um, imposed upon us. So it will be quite a, a different kind of service and it will be shorter and more reflective. But it's beginning on Sunday, May the 2nd and at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. We also are obliged to have a track and trace system in place. And because of that, and because the numbers are limited and we want to know who's coming in ahead of the time. So in the week before the Sunday, um, please, if you think you want to be at that service, we need you to contact the church office either by email or by telephone, 238-088. Contact the church office and, and say to Leslie, you're coming or how many people are coming and, and so on. She'll be able to tell you if there's still space and be able to keep a reserve list and also uh, um, be able to <coughs> um, guide us what's, what's going ahead for, for future weeks. But let us know you're coming. There has to, we have to know in advance. Um, two o'clock in the afternoon, beginning on Sunday, May the 2nd. All over the world, the Spirit is moving. Praise God. Mm -hmm. 